Hi, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. I want to talk to you today about analog sound. Having talked about natural sound last time, uh, it seems like it's time to start talking about electricity and its relationship to sound. So that's what I'm going to do today. I hope that everything's cool out there. And uh, here we go. So, um, the idea, the fundamental idea of analog sound, the word analog is sort of the same Greek root as analogy. And what it means is that what we're going to do is represent the sound pressure in the air by an electrical voltage on a wire. And by making that analogy, a whole bunch of things come out that are pretty cool. So that's the basis of what we're going to be doing today. And of course, the early and classic instrument for analog sound is the telephone. The Bell telephone had a device for changing pressure into voltage, a microphone. It had a transmission line for carrying that voltage to a remote place. And then it had a device, the speaker, for changing uh, voltage into sound pressure. And when you have those three things, you can now send sound. You can also process it as electronic signals on the way, which is also handy. So let's talk about those systems. Let's talk about the microphone. Um, the normal way you turn a sound into a voltage is with a microphone. And a microphone is simply a device that has a diaphragm of some kind that is pushed on by the air and moves in and out and then that is measured somehow so that the voltage coming out of the microphone is proportional to the air pressure change at any given point so um so there's lots of different kinds of microphones the original uh telephone had what's called a carbon button microphone which changed the electrical resistance uh, in response to the air pressure changes and that then you ran a voltage through it and that voltage varied that you got out varied based on the carbon button microphones pressure measurement uh, the classic microphone that you still see used a lot today is what's called the dynamic microphone a dynamic microphone has a coil and um, it moves a magnet in and out of that coil to uh, generate an actual voltage in the wire actually a current but you can change that into a voltage really easily and then there's the um, capacitance micro based microphones that measure the change in capacitance as you move a diaphragm in and out. Uh, an old word for capacitor is condenser. And so these are referred to typically as condenser microphones. Um, there's lots of tricks like this. Um, there's a lot of kinds of microphones and they all have the same function. We're gonna take the instantaneous air pressure or air pressure change and convert it into a signal, into a voltage. And so the voltage coming out of the um, microphone is a pretty literal representation of the sound going in. Um, microphones are terrible. Um, we should be really clear about that. Even the best, fanciest studio microphones are not great devices for measuring sound. They tend to be full of noise. They tend to have bad nonlinearities. That is, you know, sliding the signal up a bit doesn't pr produce an exactly proportional change in voltage. Um, it's pretty common that in the whole chain of things, going from the input to the output, the limiting factor is actually the microphone. But we got to record sound somehow, so what we do, we do what we can. Once you have the signal as a voltage, you're going to want to turn it back into an air pressure. So how do we do that? Well, we use a speaker. You've all seen speakers, at least boxes with speakers in them, and most of you have seen a speaker cone and coils. Again, this is a device that has a, a diaphragm attached to a coil and um, the diaphragm moves in or out as the coil is moved by changing an electromag by as sorry, an electromagnet is attached to a, a diaphragm and there's a coil that moves the magnet in or out in response to voltage changes. So a very simple version of this 
is right here. Uh, oh, where is this? Right over here somewhere. Um, you can see these guys messing around with a speaker and they're going to take the speaker inputs and hook a 9 volt battery so up to them. Don't try this at home because it's really easy to wreck your speaker. And what you'll see is when they hit the speaker coil with a 9 volt battery, the diaphragm moves in response to that voltage. And that's, you know, when that diaphragm moves, there's a change of pressure in front of the diaphragm. You're most of the way to producing a sound. So, um, you know, they're going to show that a few times from the front and back. That's cool. And if you want to see something fancier, here's a nice... Um, nice uh, slow motion video of and by the way the slow motion video is a little bit baloney because it hasn't been properly um, the, the, the camera isn't that great a high speed camera but you can see at lower frequencies especially because they're sweeping the frequency up here that sort of you know this thing's vibrating and as the as you push air in front of it the pressure gets higher as you pull it back the pressure gets lower now you're producing a sound. Welcome to the wonderful world of speakers. Speakers are not great either. Um, they, uh, they typically have linearity issues that are pretty bad. And the louder you try to make them, the more nonlinear they get. A speaker is typically not just run out in open air. A t speaker is typically put in a resonant cavity, a speaker cabinet whose job it is to sort of amplify the sound coming out of the speaker and flatten out some of its frequency stuff. And so um, the cabinet makes a big difference. Um, technically, just like a dynamic microphone measures current, a speaker mostly me measures current. So for those of you who are electronics people, you actually use a big enough coil that it has its own impedance, which effectively changes the voltage into a current in the speaker. And you know, one of the biggest problems with speakers is that, you know, you sort of have two conflicting design requirements. For, at low frequencies, it takes a lot of air motion from beginning to end to make, to move enough air to uh, sort of make a very low note, a 60 hertz or 80 hertz or 100 hertz note. And if we look at the, um, you know, there's a thing called the Huygens Fresnel principle, which says that sort of the more, the bigger, that diaphragm of the speaker is relative to the sound wavelength, the more efficient that speaker is going to be. So to make low sounds amplify efficient, you know, produce efficiently by a speaker, we need a great big speaker. Well, that's great. So why don't we just use a great big speaker? Well, because a great big speaker is heavy. Its magnet is heavy. Its diaphragm is heavy. And so that giant speaker isn't going to be able to move in and out very fast and very linearly. And so maybe we also need a smaller speaker that has, you know, is very small and light and can move in really quickly. Maybe a piezoelectric so-called tweeter. So we had a woofer and a tweeter and, you know, neither one of them worked that great in the middle. So maybe we also need a mid-range speaker. And now you've got the classic 1970s home stereo setup with a, a mid-range a, a bass and a, a tweeter speaker, a woofer and a tweeter speaker, and a, something called a crossover network that tries to send the right frequencies to the right speaker. It all gets fancy very fast, and it's still not great. But better than microphones, so there's that, which is nice. Okay, we've got a way to get a sound turned into a voltage. We've got a way to get a voltage turned into a sound. Once you've done that, you realize there are games you might want to play with the voltage itself. You might want to process that voltage in various ways. And the simplest sort of transformation like this that you can do is to attenuate the signal, make the voltage less, or amplify the signal, make the voltage more than what you started with. Attenuation is, you know, and so effectively multiply by some constant, which is either bigger or smaller than one, depending on whether you want to amplify or attenuate. And, you know, attenuation's easy. Um, that's what a volume knob does. We've talked about those before. And so that gets done a lot. Um, amplification is harder. You need fancy active electronics, but it's not that big a deal. Um, if I want to increase the voltage relative to what came in, I build some electronics and I do that. So putting this all together, we've got a signal path for a telephone 
or a stop box, you know, a guitar stop box or whatever that sort of says, well, take a microphone, convert it, the air pressure to the voltage with that, maybe process the voltage somewhere, somehow, maybe transmit it, maybe store it somewhere, maybe modify it with circuitry. Um, and then take a speaker and convert your voltage that you want to turn into a sound into a sound and you're good to go. Now one of the problems with this plan is distortion. Uh, I list two sources of distortion here. There really should be three. Um, you know, ideally this electric signal is going to exactly represent the sound pressure. We want a perfect analog, um, a metaphor, not a simile. But uh, that's not going to happen. It's very common that it isn't linear, that the, the pressure being experienced by the microphone and the stuff done by the processing doesn't sort of go exactly one to one. And so you get some distortion from that. It's very common that what happened in the past with the system influences the current thing. So you get some stored voltage or stored mechanical energy somewhere. And now all of a sudden, you know, the sound pressure coming out doesn't just depend on the sound, on the voltage coming in, you know, on the sound pressure coming in, it depends on some his complicated history function. It's also common that noise is a thing. And we talked about that before. We'll talk at some point about something called to total harmonic distortion, but this probably isn't the lecture for that. And an interesting thing here is that, you know, this kind of distortions have been happening in analog audio systems literally since there have been analog audio systems. The early days, they were worse. And over time, our brains became familiar with those and learned to process them out and really even to like them to some extent. And so now, ironically, in the last 40 or 50 years, we've spent a lot of time and effort trying to reproduce the distortions that this older, worse equipment had, you know, sort of technically worse equipment had, so that the sound sounds good coming out of the system to us. So that's, that's a thing. You know, one of, the, one of the first things you do if you're a geek and you're presented a system with an input and some processing and output is you ask, well... What happens if I hook the output up to the input? If you're not, you know, that's that's one of the nerd tests is, is your first thought. Well, I wonder what would happen if I hook the output up to the input. Well, in this case, what happens is that if the speaker is, you know, moving out to create some higher pressure, the microphone may experience that pressure coupled through the air and it may start moving in. And now the system is... Um, sort of like that spring mass spring oscillator that we looked at earlier, right? The um, You got this system with a delay between the output and the input. You've got this system that has some sort of springiness to it. And so at some point, if the output, um, you know, there's going to be some resonant frequencies of this system, just like there are with any other oscillator. And if the output is higher than the input, if the gain's positive at some frequency, well, that frequency will be amplified from basically nothing to very loud, very fast, and that's what feedback is, right? The characteristic frequencies of the feedback depend on things like the distance between the speaker and the microphone, because a big part of the delay in the system is air propagation from the speaker to the microphone, which is slow compared to electricity. It also depends on the resonances involved and that kind of stuff. You know, analog sound is awesome. Uh, representing sound as an electrical signal is um, a really nice representation in some ways. It's very accurate in time. It can represent really high and low frequencies really well. The electricity doesn't really care how fast it's changing for the most part in the audio range. But there are problems. Um, if I have noise, not just in the sense of literal random noise, but in the sense of any unwanted signal that gets into the system somehow or is produced in the system somehow, that will be simply superposed, simply added onto the voltage, and it will be very accurately represented and carried through too. It's really easy to generate noise of various kinds in an analog system, and that will be accurately represented and am amplified by the system. And the amplified part's the big part. Um, you know, you get noise in there and then it, you make it louder along with everything else. Um, a classic example, there's a very low buzzing tone, which is sort of the 60 hertz um, buzzing tone that you'll hear coming out of analog equipment sometimes. What that is, is your power lines in your room, the, the 
you know wall current in your room actually is a 60 hertz oscillating signal and that electrical signal gets into your analog electronics and is propagated through the system and so now you have a nice reproduction of not only what sound came in but also added to that a nice reproduction of the electrical fields in the room and that's super annoying well-designed electronics make that harder to do but it's still a thing that happens the other thing is that as a storage system analog's not that great the traditional storage medium for analog voltage is analog audio signals is to move a tape head over a tape and as the um tape head goes you vary the voltage which varies some magnetic field on the tape and so now i get a magnetic analog of my audio signal but it's really hard to make the tape head move linearly um, it's really hard to get decent density you tend to have to run a lot of inches per second of tape past the head to get good good uh, high frequency response the media is really fragile it tends to shed particles and do other stuff not only from sitting around but also especially when you play it each time you play it it gets worse um so we're not that excited about magnetic tape if you've ever had to deal with a cassette or worse yet some of you may remember eight tracks um not the best plan but it's what we had for a long time as far as audio storage and it was way better than not having any audio storage whatsoever the second problem of course is that you know electronic devices are expensive and complicated right they're difficult to build they don't tend to be very general purpose so if you're a guitar player you may have a pedal board with 15 effects pedals velcroed to it each of which does a particular job each of which has a lot of fancy components in it each of which costs hundreds of dollars sometimes to do this sound processing and if you and your brother want to play together they have to have a pedal board too really and so there's no sharing or anything like that everybody has to have their own fancy expensive electronics and maybe the worst problem to close on a lighter note is there are these people called audiophiles who are very excited about super high fidelity audio reproduction except they are very very excited about an, uh, analog reproduction in particular and so if you're really dealing with analog stuff you may have to deal with them some of you may be them in which case i sort of am sorry not sorry uh you know they have a lot of interesting ideas about audio so there's that but having said all that um you know analog was king for a long time and that that was for a reason it's a big improvement in how we deal with audio and next time we'll look at the latest big improvement was to say well maybe this thing of doing an analog in voltage isn't the best plan maybe we should do some kind of digital audio and actually have different better for some value of better analogs of the sound coming in that we can process and store and transmit so that was that hope everybody's staying safe and well out there it was fun to talk to you and I will talk to you again real soon.